Morning Threads. I hope you're enjoying uh, the absolutely gorgeous day we have, and I hope the wind noise here is not too much. Uh, if it is, when I watch it, I'll end up redoing this, but I really like this view. Uh, it's the Plover River out here. I can't tell if my friend's still behind me or not, but I hope he or she is. Um, not a lot of announcements because of the whole thing that's going on. So uh, only announcements probably should bring up is we're doing OK money wise, uh, at least as far as I know. And uh, only reason I'm bringing this up is because a few people have asked. Remember, you can still give online. Uh, so sptapestry.org backslash giving will take you there. Uh, and you can do all of your stuff through that if you want. Uh, you can also mail a check to the church uh, address if you want. Just know I'm not checking it very often. We don't get a lot of mail. Uh, so it may be a few weeks before uh, it's, it's deposited. So don't let that freak you out. Uh, church address is P.O. Box 992, Stevens Point, Wisconsin, 54481. Otherwise, stay in touch with each other. Know that you're loved. Let's worship together, okay?
Please join with me in prayer. O Lord our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighted down. You are the God who provides for his children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. Inhabit our praises as we gather together today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mark 19, 13 through 15. The people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such things. When he placed his hands on them, he went from there. Best dear friends, I'm excited to, um, yeah, see you guys hopefully before I move to Pittsburgh. I'm currently still in North Carolina, but anyway, I wanted to share with you some verses that have meant a lot to me, um, not just now, but even in the past as well. So it's Lamentations 3 20 through 33. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. 
They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or give or grieve the children of men. Thanks. Have a great Sunday. Bless you. Bless you. There is ever one love like thee That boundless mercy When thy sorrow grieving What king would surely die Or servant justly rule me Or run to me A wretch and trench in darkness Dead and thieving oh, Hallelujah Let me not forget The wonders of thy body As ever one died like thee, heavenward fixed thy gaze long for the Father who turned his face away and left there none beside thee, save murderers that by thy blood became thy sons and daughters. Oh, hallelujah, let me not forget the wonders of the buying God, O oh, bountiful Messiah. It's okay, as is ever one conquered soul, that death itself is humbled by thy glory. Can sin then speak for me? Or guilt certain shadows, thy pardon is thy timeless love unjustly given for me. Oh, hallelujah, let me not forget the wonders of thy buying blood, O bountiful Messiah. As ever one love like thee. As ever one love like thee, as endless seven flow, eternal sky and river, whoever does thy love, my God, my great high priest and giver. Oh, hallelujah, let me not forget the wonders of thy buying blood, O bountiful Messiah. Oh, hallelujah. Psalm 33, 1 through 5. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Okay, Threads, uh, we're going to begin a, a few week series on a couple of minor prophets. We've gone through a lot. If you remember, uh, a few weeks ago, we went through, uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, <laughs> we went through the book of Joel. Um, so today we're going to start on Obadiah. Uh, it's a great little book. It's actually the shortest uh, book in the Old Testament and, in my opinion, has the most fun name, Obadiah. It's just fun to say. Uh, you're probably repeating that to yourself now, Obadiah. So we're going to read through that and then we're going to talk 
about uh, what was going on then and how it relates to our lives now. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do because you're at home, I would encourage you to turn to uh, the book of the prophet Obadiah, which is uh, page 839 in the correct Bible, which is mine, of course. Uh, this is what uh, the word of the Lord says. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. You have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise, let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The heart, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Eden, those of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloft, while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you are like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast for so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will be returned upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion, will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire, and Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble, and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau. The peoples from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. The, uh, this company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as, as Zepharath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Zepharath uh, will possess the town of the Negev, towns of the Negev. Deliverers will come on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Now, the book of Obadiah may not seem like it's a book about brothers and cousins, but it's a book about brothers and cousins. Brothers and cousins have this fascinating relationship. Okay? There's probably no one in your life that you have fought with more than a sibling if you have one. There's probably also nobody that you've defended more than a sibling. And cousins are like that too. There's this unwritten rule that... that for some reason, I can pick on my, my brother, and he can pick on me. But if you pick on me, he's coming after you. And if you pick on my brother, I'm coming after him. For some reason, we could say the meanest things possible to our brothers and think it's okay. But woe to the person who picks on our siblings. And cousins are the same way. I spent all this time with my cousins at my grandmother's. And we fought all the time. I mean... I nearly cut one of my cousin's heads off with a piece of, of, uh, of clothesline once. It was awful, and yet we're cousins, we still talk. It's, it's this weird situation. And 
And Israel and Edom, well, they're cousins. So they began uh, from two brothers. So if you have read the book of Genesis, if not, I would encourage you to. It's a great place to begin, i.e. Genesis meaning beginnings. Uh, around chapter 25, you, you learn the story of Jacob and Esau. They, they are two brothers, two twins, that are born almost at the exact same moment. Uh, Esau is the oldest, and he's the one who is supposed to receive uh, the, the birthright and, and uh, the blessing. So his inheritance, and then also this blessing, because uh, with, within ancient Near Eastern Judaism, there's this mindset that there's, there's a physicality of words. You say something at them, and the words kind of sit there on them. So a blessing is something that stays with you for a lifetime. Uh, we actually downgrade the, the value of words. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But we all know that's not true. These, these words that, that are said, for good or for bad, they, they kind of, they're sticky. They stick on you. Uh, really good reason why we should say good things to people. Uh, it sticks with them. You can probably actually think of someone uh, in your life who said something to you that you, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, that still just sticks in your, in your crawl or in your heart. If it was something good, it still sticks with them. Anyhow, Jacob and Esau, um, they're always going at each other. And, and specifically Jacob, whose name literally means the, the supplanter, um, he's, he's tricking Esau out of stuff. Esau comes in hungry and he's just famished and he says, give me a bowl of that stuff you're eating. I love, it's so blunt. It's just like that red stuff. <laughs> Don't really care what it is. It's red. Give it to me. And um, Jacob says, I will, but you got to give me your inheritance. So Esau being first would get two thirds of the inheritance. He, he, he should get the lion's share because he's supposed to carry on the family line, name. And Jacob says, give me your inheritance. And Esau does which is not a wise choice, but he does. And then later on, even though Esau's still supposed to receive the blessing from his father, those words that will land upon him and stay upon him, well, Jacob, with the help of his mother, tricks their father out of that too. So Esau is just furious. He's going to kill his brother as soon as his dad is dead. And his mother hears this and knows this, and so she sends Joseph off. So these two brothers, can't stand each other and they separate. And yet we know from what scripture says that two nations are going to be formed out of them because this is the prophecy that is, well, the word of the Lord that is given to their mother. Uh, it says this, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca came, uh, became pregnant. And the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? She went to inquire the Lord and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. This was spoken of them before they were ever born. And this battle is taking place between the brothers. It reaches that point where, where uh, Jacob has to leave and Esau goes somewhere else. And uh, the reason this matters is because, well, they both get two new names, or they both get a new name. Esau is declared Edom because red is such an entirely important part of his life. Uh, he's covered in red hair, but also the bowl of red stuff that he eats, it's there. And, and Edom is this fascinating word because it means red, but it also harkens back to, to the word of humanity. Uh, Edom, Adam, red earth, it, it's there. And then Jacob, who runs away from his brother out of fear, and eventually decides to come back. And one night, while he is preparing himself to face the danger of a ticked off Esau, ends up wrestling with a stranger that he suddenly begins to realize is God. And he wrestles all night with him. And, and towards the end of the night, what he suffers from, or what he's given, is he's given a wrenched out hip, uh, because God cheats in a fight. And, uh, and he's given a new name. A new name that signifies that Israel excuse me, that Jacob was not willing to let go of God. And so he's given the, the name of Israel, the one who wrestles with God and humanity and overcomes. And as he holds on to, to God throughout that night, refusing to let go of him unless he's blessed, well, the fascinating thing is, is the brother who hated him 
when he meets them the next day, that brother runs to him and hugs them and cries instead. Something about holding on to God even uh, when we have to struggle to, that not only changes the dangers that we face sometimes, but almost always changes the way we face those dangers. Anyhow, so Jacob and Esau are given the names of, of Israel and Edom, and these two people form from it. They're not just cousins biologically, even though they are, they're also geographically connected. So Israel's right here, and Edom would be southwest of Israel, uh, just below and on the other side of the Red Sea. They're intimately connected. As nations, they continue to fight like cousins. So their, their national policies towards one another is they fight with one another, and then when someone else comes to fight them, they join forces. Happens again and again. Uh, that, that they argue, you got the bigger share, I, uh, I wanted this, and that's all well and good, but you come to mess with, uh, with one of them, and you mess with both of them, until the 6th century. In the 6th century, Babylon comes. And when Babylon comes and attacks the southern kingdom, well, Edom sees that as a chance to expand their territory. And instead of helping their cousins, or at the very least, just not making things worse, Edom begins to attack the, uh, the uh, cities that are on the lower part of Judah and take them over. To enter the cities and take them over and then sell the, the citizens there into slavery and, and take the possessions away. Instead of helping their cousins, instead of it, at the very least just not making things worse, well, they take advantage of it. And, and this whole prophecy, this whole dream, prophetic dream that we've been reading, is God saying, you treated your brothers like this. You continued this grudge that Esau had against Jacob, even though he had stopped. You continued this grudge and you took advantage of my people. And therefore, the way you've been treated is the way you're going to be treated. These prophecies happen all the time. Amos brings this up. Ezekiel brings this up. They condemn Edom for treating Israel in, in a manner that is not cousinly, in a manner that is not brotherly, in a manner that is selfish. And they talk about this day of the Lord coming. And one of the fascinating things, in my opinion, is, is in Obadiah, Obadiah takes the day of the Lord and he's talking about Edom, but then he spreads it to all nations. The day of the Lord is coming for all nations is what the, what the 15th chapter says. Not 15th chapter, excuse me, there's only one chapter in Obadiah. The 15th verse says it's coming for all nations. All who are prideful, because Eden, Edom is described as prideful, they are physically higher than, than Israel. They're on these cliffs, but apparently they're attitudinally also higher. They think they are better than the people of God. And God says this day of the Lord is coming. Now the day of the Lord is this time period of judgment. But it's also a time period of rescue. You see, when God judges, He judges in His character. And His character is always redemptive and forgiving. He judges Edom saying, you have treated them like this, so you are going to be treated like that also. But if you remember from when we studied the book of Joel a few months ago, Every time God spoke up a prophecy, every time God spoke up condemnation, He also talked about how things were going to come about as a result of it. One of my favorites is actually here. It's from Joel, the second chapter. That's probably really loud. It's also probably very windy right now. <laughs> Joel, the second chapter, verses 28 through 30, says the following, that after a plague of locusts was going to come and eat everything. It says, and afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days. See, when God's judgment comes, He also brings His blessing. Because he's protecting his people. He's redeeming us over and over again. And the same is true with Edom. Even though he is punishing them, well, what it says is that the kingdom will be the Lord. All these nations are going to be brought back in as Israel is brought back in. That's God's very character. 
It's this mindset that comes from what we believe is going to happen. You see, the way we believe about the day of the Lord, the way we believe about God's judgment affects the way we live. If you think that none of this matters, even this gorgeous view of the Plover River right now, if you think none of this matters, you're going to live your life in such a way that nothing matters. If you think that in the end all God wants to do is destroy things, all of this is going to be consumed with fire and that's it, you're going to live your life in such a way that all is up for destruction. If you think that God is a redeeming God who ultimately wants to redeem, you're going to live your life with this hope of redemption. It's when faith becomes hope. And hope is this amazing thing. It, it's almost like faith time traveling. Hope is this mindset of the future is going to be like this and the present is this, this terrible situation and I'm going to pull the future into the present. Hope says that, that God is generous and in His kingdom there is generosity, so now I'm going to be generous. Hope says that God is forgiving and in His kingdom all sin will be forgiven, therefore I am going to try, and I know it's hard, but I'm going to try and forgive now. Hope says that in God's kingdom fear and anxiety will be done away with, there will be no more tears, and even though there is real fear and anxiety now, hope brings that bravery from the future into the present where we can be brave in the face of real fear and anxiety. The problem is, is it's really hard to recognize that in a time period where all the days blend together. See, in a crisis you focus on the present. Edom focused on the present. They saw at that moment, here's a chance for us to expand our kingdom, and they didn't think about the past of the familiar relationships they had uh, with Israel. They didn't think about the future. They thought, at this one moment, I can improve my status. We live in a situation where, I mean, one of my favorite things is I saw somebody who took their calendar and marked off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and just marked off everything that didn't say day, because it just feels like it continues over and over again. It's this eternally boring present, this purgatory of, of the same time period over and over again, which is why so many of us have home uniforms that we wear day after day after day. Maybe you don't, I do, okay? <laughs> it's a shield shirt and I wear it all the time. But hope is bringing that future in and living it out right now. Hope says that what we're going through right now is not gonna last, so I'm not gonna live like it's gonna last. I'm gonna live out of that hope right now. Hope says that the fear I'm going through right now is not going to last. It's going to be replaced by, by, by joy in the future, and so I'm going to live out that joy. Jürgen Moltmann has a quote that I love on hope. It says the following, That is why faith, wherever it develops in hope, causes not rest but unrest, not patience but impatience, it does not calm the, the unquiet heart, but it is itself unquiet, the unquiet heart in humanity. Those who hope in Christ can no longer put up with reality as it is, but begin to suffer under it, to contradict it. Peace with God means conflict with the world, for the goad of the promised future stabs into the flesh of the ever unfulfilled present. The day of the Lord is God judging in a redemptive manner. Live in that hope. Live in that hope as we face the pandemic that's around us. Live in that hope as we face the isolation that we know is going on. Live in that hope and live in God's kingdom. If you are scared now, no that God will wipe away those fears. If you were bitter towards people, know that God is going to forgive not only your bitterness, but also their, their misdeeds. Live in that hope. Edom, focused on the present, took advantage of their brothers and sisters, took advantage of their cousins. God was going to punish that. 
but in his punishment, all nations would be brought back to him. Live in that hope. Would you join me as the Strongs lead us in our closing prayer? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Hi, kidlets. Um, I am going to read you and tell you the story of Obadiah. I have a couple of kids' Bibles, and none of them have this story in there, so I found kind of an easy version. And what I like to do sometimes when I'm telling a story or in my job, sometimes I teach people how to tell stories, and we'll make a storyboard. That's what the people at Walt Disney do when they're... Um, making Disney and Pixar movies is they plan out the story on little cards. So this is a little storyboard of Obadiah. You don't have to be a good artist to make a storyboard because you want the idea. It's not about being, making a pretty picture, it's about getting the idea down. So first of all, the book is Obadiah. And Obadiah is the name of a person, he was a man, and he was a minor prophet. What that means is it means that his book that he wrote in the Bible was shorter than the major prophets. The major prophets wrote long books and the minor prophets wrote short books. And in fact, Obadiah's book is only one chapter long and it has 21 verses. So Obadiah was a prophet and what a prophet was is a person who warns people about things particularly things that God has told them to warn people about. So in my first picture, I have Obadiah or a prophet is kind of like a lifeguard. So a lifeguard warns you when things are dangerous. So if you're at the beach and I have here, we have a shark coming up and someone's swimming and the lifeguard saying, watch out. So a lifeguard warns people of things that are unsafe in the water. And a prophet warns God's people about things that God has told the, told the prophets to warn people about. So I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 14. This is the vision of Obadiah. Remember, Obadiah is a man who is a prophet. This is what the Lord says about Edom, and Edom is a place. We have heard the message from the Lord. A messenger has been sent among the nations saying, let's go attack Edom. And then he says, look, I have made you only a small nation. Others do not respect you, but your pride has fooled you. You live in the hollow places of the cliff. Your home is up high and you say to yourself, no one can bring me down to the ground. You fly high like the eagle. You make your nest among the stars. But I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. You will really be ruined. It would be better if thieves come to you. If robbers come by night, they would steal only enough for themselves. Workers come and pick the grapes from your vines but they would leave a few grapes behind. But you, Edom, you will really lose everything. People will find even your hidden treasures. All the people who are your friends will force you out of the land. The people who are at peace with you will trick you and defeat you. They eat your bread with you now, but they are planning a trap for you and you will not notice it. The Lord says on that day, I will surely destroy the wise men from Edom I will destroy these men of understanding from the mountains of Edom. 
Then, city of Taman, your mighty men will be afraid, and everyone from the mountains of Edom will be killed. Yikes, that sounds very scary, doesn't it? But remember, this is a warning that God told Obadiah to give to the people. You did violence against your relatives, the people of Israel, so you will be covered with shame. That means you did bad things, so you're going to be embarrassed and feel bad about it. You will be destroyed forever. You stood aside without helping while strangers carried Israel's treasures away. Foreigners entered Israel's city gate. They threw lots, kind of like dice, to decide what part of Jerusalem they would take. At that time, you were like one of those foreigners. So here's where they're having to leave. Do not laugh at your brother's trouble. So look, the brother had an ice cream cone and it fell off and the, the big brother is laughing at him. Do not laugh at your brother's trouble. Do not be happy when people destroy Judah. Do not brag about the cruel things done to them. Do not enter the city gate of my people and their time of trouble. Do not laugh at their problems in their time of trouble. Do not take their treasures in their time of trouble. Do not stand at the crossroads to destroy those who are trying to escape. Do not capture those who escape alive in the time of trouble. So basically what God is saying through Obadiah is don't laugh when other people have trouble or when bad things happen to other people. Don't take things that belong that don't belong to you. So this is a warning that the people need to stop doing bad things and start being kind to each other and doing nice things.